Good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Joan Sola. I am a researcher at the Robotics Institute in Barcelona, uh, mostly doing state, state estimation for mobile robotics. And this talk is about uh, Lee theory. It's, a, it's kind of a crash course on Lee theory, um, especially for those of, of you who have um, little or no notion about, about it. Um, I suspect in this workshop um, several of the topics that are going to be after me are going to touch uh, many of the concepts that I am going to explain now. So I hope this, this first talk is going to be useful uh, for all of you. I will jump straight into the first example. So that uh, it's an example that uh, involves uh, knowledge, uh, things that you know uh, most surely. They are very easy. So I'm talking about the complex plane and the unit complex numbers and the power they have to rotate uh, vectors. So you all know that if you multiply a complex number x by a unit complex number z, um, the effect of z on x is to rotate it, producing y. Okay. So um, the, the role of this number z, um, it's uh, the topic of, of this course. z is a member of the unit complex numbers, and the unit complex numbers is one of the easiest examples of a Lie group. Okay, so with this example, you you should know what we're talking about, and we should know what is a Lie group because you you should know everything related to unit complex numbers as follows. So, a unit complex number involve, imposes a constraint on the complex plane, which can be written like this: z conjugate times z equal one. This imposes a unit norm on z. You can look then at the shape of the points um, satisfying this constraint. And this shape is a circle. It's the line, one-dimensional line, the, the unit circle in the complex plane. Um, the elements of this unit circle can be written as follows. z equals cosinus of theta plus i sine of theta. And theta is precisely the angle by which z rotated x. Um, you can compute an inverse of this um, unit uh, complex number, which is computed by, with the conjugate. You can also compose different um, operators like this by just uh, using the complex product. Okay, so these topics are uh, classic topics of Lie groups. And if I now switch to another Lie group, which is the 2D rotation matrices, you will immediately follow, um, immediately notice that everything that I explained for complex numbers, if you extract and you use it here, it's everything is applicable. So in this course, we are interested in separating uh, two things. So one thing is the operator that in this case is the rotation matrix. And the other thing is the elements this operator uh, acts onto. Okay, so we would like to separate the agent which is producing the rotation from the elements that are rotated. Okay, and the Lie group is uh, the left part of this image. So the elements that are able to transform other elements of another set. Okay. Uh, you can see clearly here that x is not a member of the rotation matrices. Uh, the vector x is just a vector. And r is able to rotate x. Okay? Um, this separation is, is quite pertinent because uh, if I now jump into a, still another Lie group, which is the group of unit quaternions, um, now I am no longer able to draw the rotated vectors in the same drawing as the group on the left. This, this wouldn't work in this case. So it's good to have this um, separation and uh, it's good for you when you follow this, uh, this talk I'm giving because we are mostly going to concentrate on what happens on the left of this image, that is on the group itself 
and not so much on the geometrical representation of, of what happens to the elements when, when they are um, transformed by this group. Okay. Um, another image which can be powerful to separate these two concepts is the action of, for example, in this case, the group of rigid transformations in the plane, which are composed by translation and rotation. This is the group SE2. Okay. And now we're going to see how when a point moves on the surface of this group, the physical representation is a robot moving on the plane. Okay? But we are going to abstract this motion on the plane to a motion of a point moving on a sphere. Okay? On a on a we call it manifold, on a surface. Right? You can you can go to more complicated cases, like for example, a humanoid has a number of, of joints. Each one of them moves in 3D space. So each one of them can be represented by an element of the SE3 group. So why Lie groups? Um, because Lie groups are an abstract and principled way to do a lot of things with these objects. Uh, some of them we have seen, like uh, compose and invert. Uh, we can also interpolate between two of these representations. We can produce uh, transformations to other objects, like translate or rotate. And uh, very importantly, we can do calculus on these on these objects, thanks to the Lie theory. So we can we can perform integrals, uh, differentiate, like construct uh, Jacobians and these kind of things and therefore deal with uncertainty in a very elegant and, 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 uh, and good way. Uh, all of this allows us to, to construct really powerful algorithms for estimation, planning, control, probably also learning and many areas of engineering. Um, so, uh, and most of the concepts can be, not most, all of them, can be abstracted. So once you grasp the intuition behind all this, uh, you become very, very powerful in all these uh, endeavors. I organized this uh, presentation in a number of topics. Um, uh, after the presentation that I've uh, just provided, I will present you the Lie group by its formal definition, uh, involving the concepts of group on one side manifold on another side and action which is the transformation power of, of these groups um, then i will present the tangent space a very important concept in lie theory which comes in two forms the lie algebra and a cartesian form it's a regular uh, cartesian space um, next i will present the exponential map which is a mapping that will transform elements from uh, the tangent space to the Lie group manifold. Or conversely, the logarithmic map, it transforms uh, elements of the Lie group into elements of the tangent space. After that, I will introduce a couple of uh, very hand handy operators called plus and minus. These are just a couple of shortcuts to, to condensate a few operations that are being done. And with this couple of operators, I will be ready to introduce you to the adjoint matrix, which is one of the one of the objects in Lie theory that are, that is very useful. And after presenting all this material, we will start by um, uh, introducing you to the calculus. That means how to compute derivatives and Jacobian matrices how to deal with uncertainty and how to handle the covariances matrix and these kind of things through, for example, nonlinear functions involving uh, Lie groups. And also, of course, how to perform integration. For example, how to integrate velocity into motion uh, in the, concept, in the um, context of Lie groups. I will finish with a couple of applications. So what is a group? Um, the group is defined through four axioms. So a group is a set of elements, a set G of elements of the type, for example, X, Y, Z, together with an operation, which is sometimes called composition, sometimes it's called the group uh, law, things like that. So 
with the four axioms uh, as follows. Composition of two elements gives an element also in the group. For example, the product of two rotation matrices is always a rotation matrix. Okay. Uh, there exists an element which is the identity. When we operate the identity with, with any other element, we obtain the element. There is an inverse um, element inside the group. When we operate an element with its inverse, we obtain the identity. And this operation of composition is associative, okay? as, as you can see in the, in the last line. Okay, it is to note, and very importantly, that uh, most of the groups that are interesting, that are not trivial, uh, this operation of composition is non-commutative. You, you know, for example, that rotations in 3D are non-commutative. Rotations in 2D are commutative. Um, okay, so this is about the group. About the concept uh, of manifold, uh, a Lie group is a group that is also a smooth manifold. First, let me tell you what is a smooth manifold. So a manifold is like a surface, like a hyper surface in, in, in a space, uh, which, and it's smooth, it means it has no edges or spikes. Okay, so we're dealing with uh, surfaces that are, that are smooth. Um, modern definitions of Lie groups, put it otherwise, is like say, okay, the Lie group is a smooth manifold whose elements satisfy the group axioms. It's the same thing. Okay, the third concept to introduce groups is uh, through its action. Um, so a group by itself, mm, maybe it wouldn't need an action by itself, but we use groups because of the power they have to transform other elements. So we use rotation matrix to rotate vectors, not just to manipulate these rotation matrices, but to actually rotate things. All right. So this notion of action is, is um, it comes with the notion of groups. Actually, at the beginning of this theory in the last century, actually 19th century, uh, this was known as continuous transformation groups. Okay. Um, so the action uh, is quite trivial. It also has two axioms. The first one says that if you operate uh, an element of another set with the identity element, the element is not changed, which makes a lot of sense. And the other one is that if you first compose two uh, elements of the group and then you, you act on a vector b, is the same thing as first acting with one of the elements, y in this case, and secondly acting with the other element. Okay, so these operations can be interchanged. Okay, so let me now talk about the topology of Lie theory. That means, <clears throat> what does it look like, uh, geometrically speaking, to have a group manifold, to have a tangent space, to have uh, exponential map, all these kind of concepts. Okay, so in this drawing, you will notice that there is a sphere. This sphere represents the manifold of a particular Lie group. All right, I introduced to you before the unit complex number uh, this sphere would be the unit circle. For the quaternions, the, this would be a, a three-dimensional surface of a spherical shape embedded in a four-dimensional uh, space. That would be the quaternion group. Um, so this is about the manifold. Uh, this manifold, in one point of this manifold, uh, we can find the identity element of the group. Okay, that would be number one for complex numbers or the identity matrix for rotation matrices. On this point, we can build a tangent space, which is a linear space, which is tangent to the manifold at this point. Okay, so we can put tangent spaces at any point, but the particular tangent space at the identity point is called the Lie algebra. Then on this D algebra, we can define uh, vectors, which will be, of course, tangent to this point of the manifold. And if these vectors, we wrap them onto the manifold, like you can, you can see here, like a sphere and a piece of string, and we can, we're trying to wrap the string onto the sphere surface, okay? Uh, this wrapping follows what we call the geodesic, which is the greatest arc possible in the, in the manifold, okay? And so the operation of wrapping the string onto the manifold 
is called the exponential map. So it's a mapping that takes a vector of the tangent space and produces an element of the group. And the inverse is the logarithmic map that uh, performs the inverse mapping. So clearly, the tangent space, it's a, it's a linear space, which is tangent to the manifold, uh, because the manifold has no spikes or this kind of thing, so it's smooth. This tangent space is unique. It is a vector space. Because it's a vector space, we can uh, use calculus on it. The dimension of this vector space uh, is equal to the degrees of freedom of the manifold. And as I said, the, this tangent space at the identity is called the Lie algebra. Let's see what is the um, structure of this tangent space uh, in an algebraic form. Okay, to do so, um, we take the constraint of the group. Now I concentrate as an example on the unit complex numbers. So you take the z conjugate times z equal 1 and differentiate with respect to time. That means seeing what happens with the velocity of these things. Okay, So uh, you end up having this property, z conjugate times uh, z dot equals minus z conjugate z dot conjugate. So you have one thing which is exactly equal to minus its conjugate. And in the complex plane, this can only be uh, accomplished if this kind of object is an imaginary number. So z conjugate z dot is an imaginary number, so we can write it as i omega for omega in the real numbers. So um, we have defined this way, the Lie algebra, as the space of imaginary numbers. And we can also think of this space as the one-dimensional line, which is the imaginary numbers, but we can encode it perfectly with a real number. So uh, it's, it's a line anyway. So if, if we have i omega, we can also tell you omega, and, and, and you have the same information. Okay? So there exist uh, two ways of representing this tangent space, which are isomorph. And you have an operator that goes from the Lie algebra, uh, which is called the hat operator. So omega hat is equal to i omega for omega in the real numbers. And you have the opposite, which is omega equals minus i omega hat. Okay. Um, the same thing, same thing happens, for example, for 3D rotation matrices. Uh, the algebra is a little bit more complicated, but not so much. So you apply the same uh, differentiation to the, to the um, constraint, and you end up having r transpose r dot equal to minus its own transpose. And that means that r transpose times r dot is a skew symmetric matrix. And uh, a 3 by 3 skew symmetric matrix, matrix has 3 degrees of freedom. And so the Lie algebra has three degrees of freedom. And therefore, the tangent space of the rotation matrices in 3D is a three-dimensional linear space. Okay? To highlight this a little bit stronger, uh, you have this Lie algebra structure, which is the, uh, formed by skew symmetric matrices. And you see it's a linear combination of three base elements with three uh, coordinates. We can organize these coordinates into a regular vector and have the Cartesian representation of this tangent space. All right. Uh, I want to notice that there is one tangent space, just that you can represent it in two different ways. One way would be the skew symmetric matrices, omega cross, and the other way would be regular vectors. Um, for many, many, many things in Lie theory, and, and also in other areas, it's much more practical to work with vectors than to work with uh, strange objects like skew symmetric matrices or uh, imaginary numbers as before, things like this. So in all the groups, we'll, we'll be able to represent the tangent elements as a Cartesian vector. That's, that's very powerful. Uh, these vectors can be stacked in larger vectors if necessary and very importantly can be manipulated with uh, matrix algebra. Okay. 
second notion is the exponential map. As I said, uh, this map uh, goes from tangent space to manifold and, and back. And to see a little bit how it works, let us uh, take the um, previous equation. So R transpose R dot equals a skew symmetric matrix and integrate this um, differential equation. The, the result is R of t equals R0 times exponential of omega cross times t. Okay, We can see already the exponential here appearing. And uh, at the origin, R0 uh, equals uh, the identity. And so we have R of t equals the exponential of omega cross t. Right? Uh, actually, omega would be the um, rotation rate, and t is time, and the product is just an angle. So we can very well write the exponential of theta cross. Okay, how do we find, for example, closed loop expressions for this exponential? You just write the Taylor expansion and then manipulate a little bit the, the elements using notions of trigonometry or things like that. And you end up with a well-known formula that the exponential of theta cross is a 2 by 2 matrix, in this case for the SO2 group, which is cosinus theta, sinus theta, sinus theta, cosinus theta. Um, so this is the rotation matrix, and it's the exponential of the um, tangent element theta cross, which is a skew symmetric matrix. Therefore, the exponential of uh, theta uh, cross is R of t, and the opposite way is the logarithmic map. So theta cross is the logarithm of R. We can also build exponential maps uh, departing directly from the Cartesian representations. So that would be a shortcut between the isomorphisms from uh, Cartesian to Lie algebra plus the exponential map. And so uh, we differentiate these uh, two exponentials by calling the second one the capitalized exponential map. It goes from theta to r, and the log is from r to theta. The result is this kind of um, sketch of mappings. So on the left, you have the two representations of the tangent space. On the right, you have the manifold and you have all the mappings um, related to transforming points from one place to the other place. Okay, The two capitalized mappings are just shortcuts, but are very useful. We use them especially to introduce uh, another shortcut, which is a, an operator that combines composition in the group with exponential. Okay. This combination allows you to take an element x and add on top of it another element, which is the exponential of omega. Okay, so you call this x plus omega, right? So I repeat, you have an element x of the group, you have another element, another element omega of the tangent space of the group at this point x. And then you have x plus omega, which is the result of adding omega onto x. Okay, We call this the plus operator. Likewise, we can define the minus operator, which takes two elements of the group and expresses its difference as an element of the tangent space at one of the points, in this case, at x. Okay. Now, with these two operators, we are in position to understand or to represent uh, graphically the adjoint uh, of the group. Okay, imagine you have, uh, as in this drawing, a manifold M, and you have the identity E and a point X. And you can express this point Y in two forms. One is the concatenation of the exponential of sigma composed with x. The other way is the concatenation of x with the exponential of tau. Okay, These two operations bring you to the point y. And so you have this identity uh, sigma plus x equals x plus tau. Okay, We can develop this using the definitions of this operator plus. 
and we arrived at the relation between tau and sigma, which is linear. And if tau and sigma are represented in its Cartesian form, remember tau and sigma are tangent vectors to the manifold, uh, so we choose the Cartesian representation for them, then the adjoint at the point x is a matrix that transforms uh, the vector tau into the vector sigma. So the adjoint is a linear operator and maps elements of the tangent space of m at the point x two elements of the tangent space of M at the identity. This, uh, in this course, I don't have time to explain more intuitions about the adjoint, but it's an object that is very useful uh, later on. So you have here uh, a, a quick presentation of it. Um, so with this plus and minus operators and with the adjoint, we are now ready to uh, enter the calculus um, uh, part of Lie theory. So, uh, in this case, uh, we choose the Cartesian uh, representation for vectors to represent perturbations, errors, increments on our variables. And so, we will see that we can easily define Jacobians of functions involving elements from one manifold, maybe transforming them to elements of another manifold. And we can also uh, define and manipulate covariances and therefore uh, deal with uncertainty in an elegant way. First of all, let's see how can we define a Jacobian or a derivative that is um, powerful and also um, easy to use, easy to understand and intuitive. So basically, uh, what we can do is uh, take on the left, you see the classical representation, the, ca the classical formula for a derivative in a vector space. And we substitute the plus and minus here on the left with our new plus and minus operators and define a derivative in this manner. OK, this is very, very pertinent. Let's see how we can compute them. So what we do is uh, apply the definitions and try to reduce the numerator of this uh, limit to a linear form, and then we get the Jacobian just by, by identification. Um, let's see an example. Let's imagine we have a function. It's the rotation uh, in 3D. So this function takes a matrix R and a point P and produces the product R times P, producing a rotation on the point P. Okay, so how can we compute the derivative of this function? So first of all, the derivative with respect to the rotation matrix. So what does this mean? Um, a rotation matrix has nine numbers, but only three degrees of freedom. So what this uh, derivative is doing is computing the um, variations of the output just with respect to the degrees of freedom of the input. That means that the variations are expressed in the tangent space of the output and uh, the, the, the output variations and the input variations are in the tangent space of the rotation matrix, which is 3D. So this dfdr is actually a 3 by 3 matrix and can be computed easily by just following a few steps. Okay? Uh, it has to be noticed that the plus operator here applies to the SO3 manifold. However, the minus sign here, because the result of R times P is a vector in 3D, it's just a regular minus for vector spaces, because a point in 3D is just a vector space. Okay. The second derivative, it's uh, easier. It doesn't involve very much uh, thinking. Uh, the same process, uh, you obtain that the derivative of uh, the rotation with respect to the point is the rotation matrix itself. That's no surprise. Okay, in this case, the plus and minus operators uh, match exactly the plus and minus sign signs on, on vector spaces. So, as indicated, the Jacobian maps um, tangent vectors from the input manifold M to tangent vectors on the output manifold N. Okay, that's why it's a Jacobian matrix, because it transforms vectors into vectors. 
to operate um, on to, to perform uh, differentiation only groups, we follow uh, a number of very easy rules. For example, for each group you will have a number of closed formulas, for example the adjoint or one thing called the right Jacobian, which is no less than the derivative of the exponential map. And then you have the two derivatives of action that we have just seen for uh, SE3, SO3. Okay. Then you have another group of formulas that apply to all groups indistinctly. For example, the Jacobian of the inverse is minus the adjoint. Okay, we can prove that and it's easy. And the Jacobians of the composition are always like this, regardless of the group. Okay, this is always true. Then um, you can deduce a number of other Jacobian blocks by manipulating the first ones. For example, you can get the Jacobian of the log is the right Jacobian of log of x minus 1, for example. The Jacobians of plus can be computed like this, minus, similarly, these kind of things. When you have this, and you have any other function involving uh, manifolds, you just apply the chain rule, and it gives you uh, very quickly uh, expressions of the Jacobians that, I insist, they map tangent vectors into tangent vectors. Okay, finally, um, well, not finally, but almost finally, um, how do we deal with perturbations? How do we express them? So basically, a perturbation on x, we express it on the tangent space at x. So we can say that the perturbed uh, element x is equal to the unperturbed x bar plus a per perturbation tau. Okay, in this manner, very practical because we can define the covariance of x, which is actually the covariance of tau. So we just put the covariance of tau and substitute tau by its expression uh, involving x and x bar. And that's the expression of the covariance of x. Okay, it, it is pretty much the same as the regular covariance definition, just the minus sign is substituted by the minus operator. And using this formula and using the previous Jacobian formulas, so now we recover the well-known um, way of propagating uncertainty. So you have a function y equals uh, f of x. You have its Jacobian, j, is dy dx. And to transform covariance on, on x into a covariance on y, you just multiply left and right by the Jacobian, as usual. Now the last point is integration. That's going to be very easy. So as we said, uh, in continuous time, the exponential for constant velocity, um, the integration is just the exponential. And for discrete time, you just uh, break uh, the velocity into piecewise constant trajectories. And then you use the plus operator as, as many times as you wish to create your trajectories. Okay, so now I will present a couple of examples, uh, both of them in, in, in the field of estimation, which is what I do. Uh, the examples involve a moving robot, which is this triangle, which is observing a number of beacons or landmarks in the environment. So the first example is an EKF-based um, map-based uh, map localization uh, with EKF. So we have the poses of the robot, which can be, for example, in, in SE3, position and rotation. Uh, covariance and the beacons are represented by points in 3D. Okay, we can write the motion model using the integration that we have presented in the last slide and we can write also the measurement model. So how do we take measurements of a beacon B from a pose X? Okay, and now we build the prediction stage so uh, usually uh, usual for EKF and the correction stage. Uh, so I'm not giving a course on EKF here, but I want to notice that uh, these equations are pretty much the same you use in, in typical EKF, but there are a number of differences. First one is the covariance is defined on the tangent space of the elements of the group. Okay, so in case of rotation matrices, this covariance is three-dimensional because the tangent space is three-dimensional. So P is a three by three matrix. Uh, we have the integration formula for motion. 
we have the um, tangent space because we are actually integrating velocity and velocity is tangent to whatever it's moving. Uh, so this belongs to the tangent space. We have the inverse operator. We have the action here. Um, and we have the way to compute Jacobians, which are also mapping tangent spaces. Okay. And finally, we have the update on the, on the Kalman filter state, which is using the plus sign. So other than this, uh, the appearance of this um, is pretty much the same as regular EKF. Second example is using smoothing and mapping. So now we, are, uh, we want to uh, use um, uh, least squares techniques to solve a similar problem. In this case, both the poses of the robot and the beacons are unknown. And we organize a state vector as a composite of, of Lie groups, three poses and three, three landmarks. And we optimize, um, we minimize this least squares problem. So we write uh, the residuals of each one of our measurements, build the Jacobians and the final residual, compute the Newton step, update the state, and iterate. This is just least squares, iterative least squares for non-linear non uh, systems. Again, I want to notice here the use of the plus and minus operator at sensitive places and the use of the uh, Jacobians uh, as the way we have defined them. Okay, so, so far for this course, very quick, a lot of material. Um, if you want more information, uh, we've written a paper covering in, in very much detail everything that I explained here. Um, we also have built a C++ library called Manif, check it out. Um, uh, with Manif, we have a cheat sheet, a lot of formulas involving uh, Lie groups and Lie theory. And there is on YouTube a course very similar to this one, which is a little bit more than one hour long, that I hope you can find also useful. So thank you very much. I, give you, I leave you with uh, the next speaker, which is Taeyun Lee, uh, with his talk. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.